ways back there that they, uh, they finished high school and college, and, and I'm just glad that they're here tonight to share with us. Velma has uh, been an active part of this church. Uh, she has a long history as far as Vacaville goes, and many of you know that because she's been so active in serving the Lord through music as well. So we've asked her to come and just give a word of testimony related to her relationship to Everett, and they're working together through the years. Velma? I do love to hear Everett play. <laughs> I have known Everett many years, you can tell by my hair here. I first, became, I first became acquainted with Everett here in Vacaville, where the Presbyterian Community Church was lucky to have Everett as organist. Here is a program of a sacred concert in that church dated 1939. Everett plays on this program six times. And how fortunate we are to here at Trinity to have Everett ever faithful in the Lord's service. Every Sunday I look forward with anticipation and delight to hear Everett's original him arrangements so fantastically played by him with much feeling and sensitivity of expression. Now, if you do not know Everett, some of you might not, you might not know how fortunate we are to have him. So I will attempt to explain. Everett is considered one of the country's finest theater organists. Everett was staff organist at the Fox Theater in San Francisco for 19 years. That was 1944 to 1963. He often played for audiences of 5,000. Now, the Fox Theater was one of five theaters in the whole world to have a four manual organ with a 349 stop console with its own independent elevator, and with 36 ranks. I asked Everett this week what ranks meant. <laughs> now, he knows why I asked him. The organ has, <laughs> the organ has 2,000, had 2,580 pipes. These pipes were stored in rooms or chambers going 10 stories high. The largest pipes, were too large to be stored in a room, so they were laid horizontally above the theater ceiling, also 10 stories high. One time, Everett took me to San Francisco to hear that fabulous organ, and I will ever be grateful to Everett for the opportunity to not only hear that mighty Wurlitzer organ, but also to see the whole organ set up from the basement up to above the theater ceiling, also 10 stories high. Can you ever imagine how much Everett enjoyed that organ? One of the grandest organs in the whole world, that organ was Everett's baby. <laughs> Before the Fox Theater was so unfortunately torn down, Recording engineer Frank Killinger worked with Everett to make recordings of that mighty Wurlitzer organ. Then people could buy records like this. A video was also made showing the wonders of the theater, shows Everett playing the Fox Theater organ. It even shows the demolishing of the theater and it will be on afterwards, after the program. Because of the widespread sale of these records, farewell to the Fox and memories of the fabulous Fox, Everett became known worldwide. Now that's a pretty good honor, I'd say. When I was in Portland, Oregon at the organ grinder, I asked the organist there if he knew Everett. 
He said he sure did and that he had every one of Everett's records that were available. My son George was in the mall at Seattle, Washington. As he was walking along, he heard organ music. Having played Everett's records many times, he recognized the music as Everett's playing, and sure enough, he found out that they were playing Everett's records in the mall. Everett has also been featured at other theaters. The Orphan in San Francisco also the Warfield and the El Capitan. In Oakland, at the Paramount, the Fox Oakland, and the Grand Lake. Everett has been in great demand at state and county fairs, at conferences and conventions, concerts, even weddings, television and radio, and Cal Expo. Everett played the National Presidential Nominating Convention at the Cal Palace in 1956. He played at the Arden Pipe and Pizza, at the Organ Grinder in Portland, Oregon, and the, at the Paramount Theater in Portland, Oregon. Playing for churches has always been special to Everett. He started soon after the age of 14. Everett plays every Thursday for the Rotary Club here in Vacaville, held at the Nut Tree. Everett, of course, is popular with organ clubs. He played for the conventions of the American Theater Organ Society and the annual Home Organ Society held at Asilomar, California. Here is a journal of the American Theater Organ Society, and Everett is pictured on the front, you know, playing his Fox Theater organ. And inside is a wonderful article concerning Everett. Now, you would think that music was Everett's occupation. But until retirement, Everett accomplished all of his music basically on weekends because Everett was holding a full-time demanding position with the University of California. Everett holds a bachelor's degree in agriculture from the University of California at Berkeley, and he holds a master's degree in agronomy from the University of Dav at Davis. Now, what I have mentioned is by far not all that Everett has done. One thing for sure, and this is really important, he has given hours of enjoyment to many people through his music. And I think we could all agree with that. Who would ever think that this very kind, unassuming, sincere, and humble man who faithfully serves the Lord with his magnificent and majestic music could have accomplished so much. How fortunate we are and how much we owe him our grateful appreciation. And so to you, Everett, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Right, Everett's going to come and play for us again. Thank you, Velma. And then we'll ask Otto Barner to come after he's uh, completed this next number and uh, share a word of testimony with us as well.
as I was getting dressed this evening, my telephone rang, and they told me that I was going to be on this program tonight. So you can see I'm well prepared. But I remember five years ago when we had the 20 years of Everett, we had some very good testimonials. They were beautiful. One was by Linda Steck. And she told all about the date he was born and where he lived and all the stops in the organs. And uh, she covered everything. And then uh, Debbie Moore was next. And uh, Debbie was telling us what a beautiful man there it is. And uh, he, he, in the organ choir, they had a practice. And he, he was at all, all the practices. And, um, and uh, she said he would also say he was a very humble man and very shy. But when you got to know him, it was a, a lot different because he has a great sense of humor. <laughs> and then uh, Raymond Ruth was telling about when he was in the service in 1945, he stopped at San Francisco when he happened to go into the Fox Theater. Well, he said he was so amazed at the beauty of that theater that when he stood in the lobby, his chin drugged the carpet. <laughs> and so, uh, when he came back two years later, he, he again went to the Fox Theater and heard Everett. Of course, he didn't know Everett at the time. And, uh, but they developed a very close friendship with Everett. And I know Raymond, Ruth, and Everett were very close friends. Then it finally came my time to get there, and everybody had given all the statistics and knew everything was going on. And then I said something I'm not ever going to say again. I felt like a mosquito in a nudist camp. I knew what I was supposed to do, but I didn't know where to start. <laughs> and at that time, we heard about Wayne Gross. He was a gremlin that was always changing the music whenever it was going to play the service. But I'm going to hear, stand here tonight and I'm going to defend it, uh, poor Wayne. Poor Wayne, when he was in Oklahoma, just a child, he thought the hills of Oklahoma was the national anthem. <laughs> when he was a little boy, he used to skip around the hills of Oklahoma, and he was singing, uh, what's that song that Burl Lives always sings? Oh, Jimmy Crack Corn, but I don't care. And so when he finally came here, I think it was, what was it? I think it was 1975, and he heard Everett play the organ. Well, he was amazed. He'd never heard music like that before. That's all he ever heard, you know, in all these the Southern Gospel music. So anyhow, <laughs> after a while, he, he, he got to know Everett. We didn't know him too well at the time, but he started changing, changing the music all the time. And so anyhow, we knew he was the one that was at fault for doing all these things. But uh, Everybody knows the statistics about Everett, but to play at the, at the Fox Theater was a, in a great honor. At that time, they had a lot of theaters in San Francisco, and there was, a, there was one called the Californian, and they had a large orchestra and an organist, and then they had the Warfield, which is still there, and they had a large orchestra and an organist, and uh, these were all big theaters. And then just, and that was at the Sixth Market. And then there was the Golden Gate Theater. There was another had a theater that was a beautiful big show. And, and uh, they had a, a large orchestra. And I think it was led by Claude Sweeten at the time. And uh, the next theater, right, they were all close together, you know, between Fifth and, and Ninth Market. And then there was the Pantages, which is now the Orpheum. And then came the Fox. That was the, that was the big thing. So when you think of all the organists in San Francisco and all the organists, almost any place in California would just love to have been the organist at the Fox Theater. That was a great honor. And Everett was chosen. And he chose a beautiful man. I've, got, I've been uh, well acquainted with Everett now, and I think we're very close friends. And uh, we call each other back and forth on the phone sometimes. And for a while, I had him fooled. I have a very poor speaking voice, but he didn't even recognize me. And he called uh, Louise to the phone sometimes. And she finally said, I heard her say one day, that must be Otto Barner. 
So then that kind of spoiled it. And I had a recording I wanted to play, a tape I made that I wanted to play tonight, but it was a very poor tape. And in the tape, he was telling me, he gets up and he says, uh, I, this is Mr. Sills speaking. I represent Sears Roebuck and Company, and we're selling shingles, and we have a very good offer, one that you can't refuse. And he said, if you, if you call over and ask for Mr. Zilch, uh, and I'll arrange to have, have you get a good price or anything you undertake. So I, I called back and I said, um, I want to speak to Mr. Zilch. Mr. Zilch, I'd like to buy all the shingles you sell, but I don't want the house, my outside with shingles. I want my shingles in the bedroom. And I says, I only have a little bedroom, six feet by eight feet, and I'd like you to call me back and tell me how much that would cost me. I'd like to know how many shekels that would cost me. So I didn't get, get to get play that tape. But it was, you couldn't understand it when we played it. <laughs> but we have a lot of fun talking back and forth. And, and uh, I was quite enthused uh, hearing Everett in, in the, uh, play the organ. He plays such beautiful introductions and such beautiful endings. And he can modulate, the way he modulates one song to another is, is really outstanding. I, I think Everett is a, is a shy man. He is a humble man, and he is a, a real good person. I'm sorry I couldn't give you all the statistics, because I, I had about 20 minutes to, to, to do it. And so that's about it. Everett, we love you. Um, something Otto said about Everett being a humble man, you, you just, unless you know this man, you, you know how true, if you do know him, you know how true this is. And um, I have to let, let one secret out of the bag tonight, Everett, because, um, you know, when, when, uh, when a pastor struggles for God's will in his life where God wants them to serve, um, it's, it's a traumatic experience, and it takes a lot of prayer, and it's a lot of reinforcement of where God wants us to be. And um, uh, the secret I'm letting out is ever so humble. He doesn't even come in here during the day and practice until we're all gone at lunch. See, he uses the lunch hour because he knows no one's around. He won't disturb anybody, and he can, he can do what he wants. But see, sometimes he's not aware, and I'm still up in my office at lunchtime, and I hear that organ crank, crank up, and he starts playing away, and just loud, and it just echoes in here. And uh, quite often, I, I just had to throw my pencil down and come back out here, and I stand up here, and we just go at it together. I sing, and he plays, and no one's around, but we have a great time. And God just confirmed in my mind, I have just never worked uh, with a man like, like we have here at the organ. And, and what a blessing it is to me as minister of music to have such a wonderful man uh, Talent aside, which is tremendous, what a spirit to be able to work with you, Everett. And uh, I say that from the bottom of my heart. I thank the Lord that we're allowed to work together. Let's.
we've had a great time in just being together tonight, and I thank Everett for playing, and I know that you have, and you'll continue to express your love and your appreciation to him. You know, we tried so hard to try to surprise Everett, as far as this evening goes, but uh, we won't tell you how, but somehow he searched and found a bulletin. <laughs> you know, you just can't keep anything from this fellow, but uh, there's still some things that he's hopefully uh, will be surprised about later. But we're so thankful that we've been able to just be blessed tonight with uh, this time of sharing. Linda's going to come now, and I just want to say for the two of us, when we first came in 1971, I had not heard of Everett. Uh, as uh, I'd known him as long as some of you, but right away we just sensed that we were so richly blessed just to be able to share together. And back in those days, we had a very small Hammond organ, and I think uh, one, of the, one of them is still in the choir room. Somebody asked me the other day, Pastor, are we storing organs? There's two of them in the choir room, I believe. But uh, uh, those were good days, and you, all of the people who have come to this church have noticed that the organ playing is a little bit different than what they're used to. And uh, what, you, what you just sense coming out in that, that Everett's got a theater organ background instead of uh, so much of a church organist background. But God has taken that and I believe blessed our lives with music that's alive, that praises the Lord. I don't know about you, but I've never gone to sleep in Everett's organ playing time. Now, you maybe have gone to sleep in my preaching time, but you've never gone to sleep in the organ playing time. But uh, we're so blessed, and we praise God for him. And I've just asked Linda to come and, and share how the Lord has blessed her and blessed us through Everett's ministry in this church. Well, Otto, since you liked my testimony five years ago, I'm going to shoot it to you again. Actually, I did, um, as I was praying about this, Milton said, well, what, why didn't you say some of the things you said five years ago? And I said, well, because that was five years ago. And Milton said, no one will remember it except Otto. <laughs> <clears throat> but scripture tells us that music was used in farewells, for entertainment, for weddings, funerals, sacred processions, victory celebration, and dedication services. And since I have known Everett Norse, I've known him to play in one or more of these functions. Scripture also mentions various types of instruments, such as the horn, cymbals, bagpipes, psaltery, harp, pipe, flute, lyre, timbrel, trumpet, and castanets. How wonderful that many of these would be found on the stops of an organ, and that Everett would be blessed by God to play this instrument for his honor and his glory. During Everett's teenage years, while he was busy chasing Louise and playing the organ, Al Jolson was at the height of his career, Florence Ziegfeld was making headlines with the Ziegfeld Follies, and Jerome Kern's musical classic, Showboat, was a hit on Broadway. Lindbergh completed his famous flight to Paris, and guess what was on the hit parade? Five foot two, eyes of blue. But who is Everett Norris? Born June 8, 1911, in Chico, California, he grew up in Oakland and at six years old played piano and was composing some of his own music two years later. At 14, he became fascinated with the pipe organ and studied for two years. He and his family frequently attended their neighborhood Parkway Theater and he fell in love with the sound of the theater organ. He finally had a chance to play a real Wurlitzer in Oakland while he was in high school, and this was arranged because his music teacher wanted him to demonstrate uh, the music for her music appreciation class at the Diamond Theater. The manager of the theater heard Everett play and liked him so much, he invited him to play whenever he wanted to. He soon began playing occasionally for Saturday afternoon stage shows. He was hooked. Between 1928 and 1934, he was playing on a number of Bay Area organs in various theaters and radio station KFWM and three different churches. In 1935, he got to play at the Fox Oakland for a New Year's Eve singing program. This led to weekends for many years to come. 
1944, he had a very dear friend, C.E. McDonald, who was managing the San Francisco Fox and offered him the job as a theater organist. The organ was installed in 1929, as Velma just said, at a cost of approximately $65,000. The seating capacity was 5,000 seats. Everett had the opportunity to play with several famous theater organists, such as George Wright, and meet and work with countless others. And in the periodical that Velma shared with you, and Everett has shared with me several times, how the organ would come up from the floor on an elevator, and here was Everett. The periodical that she shared with you called Theater Organ did a write-up on him in 1985. And as I remember, I remember bits and pieces, um, a man was visiting here in the United States from Scotland and secured a copy of that. And the first thing he wanted to do when he got here was look up Everett Norse. Do you remember that? I've had the privilege of knowing this dear man and his precious wife for years. I know him as a humble man who reluctantly talks about himself or his achievements others would jump at. He is kind and warm and unassuming with a terrific sense of humor. Sometimes he'll call me and he'll just say, Linda, have you heard this one? And it is probably the corniest joke I have ever heard. <laughs> and sometimes I'll do him the same way. But he is such a dear man. And I've shared this story before, but when he retired in 1977, we were invited to his retirement dinner. With Betty and Raymond Ruth and I, Milton and I went together, and we were all dressed up and after five clothes and so on. And after it was over, I think Betty and I were in the back seat, and we got the idea that wouldn't it be fun to toilet paper Everett's house? So we went to the store and got a bundle of toilet paper and just decorated it so nice. And Milton stuck his garden hose in his mailbox. and. So, I mean, the front porch was just draped terrifically with this toilet paper. And here we are in our evening clothes, you know, and, and so we drove around, just couldn't wait for him to come home. And we just kept driving around, and we noticed that the toilet paper had not been moved one inch. His car was there, and we knew he was home. But we, to this day, do not know how Everett and Louise got in that house because there was not a, a piece of toilet paper disturbed. And to make matters worse, Everett mentioned not one word about it. <laughs> the following Christmas, under our tree, Everett and Louise gave us a gift, and we opened it up, and it was a pack of four-roll toilet paper. <laughs> the Bible speaks of the greatness of one who will humble himself in Matthew 18, 4, whom then humbles himself he is the greatest in the kingdom of, God, of heaven. He is a man with a great talent, but realizes this talent is a gift from a loving God. Who is Everett Norse? A friend, a father, a husband, a gifted musician dedicating his talents to the glory of God. Because Everett knows there is no greater love.
if he had died for angels or seraphim on high, I could understand, but amazed I stand that for sinners lost he'd die. There is no greater love than that of Christ above that made him stoop to earth become a man and by his death provide redemption's plan. There is no greater love. That's why I'm singing all. God's love so rich and free. This morning I shared from the 100th Psalm, and I just want to close with that, the outline that's in your bulletin. We'll move to next Sunday night and share that message from the Sermon on the Mount at that time. But I want to close with uh, the first three verses of Psalm 100. If I may paraphrase it in this fashion related to this evening. Play joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful playing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Would you bow with us for a moment, please? Maybe in the quietness and stillness of these moments, whether child, teenager, or an adult, that God has just touched your heart tonight and reminded you that we've all been called to serve the Lord. And there are so many ways of doing that. And maybe through this evening's service, you'd want to take just this moment to recommit your life and your service to the Lord. Thank Him for the privilege. Maybe you'd want to come. Maybe there's a decision God's placed in your heart. Our pastors are here if you'd want to come and just speak to one of them. Let's just take a moment to be still before the Lord, to pray, and let God have his will and his way in each of our lives. Father, in these closing moments, our hearts are filled with joy because of you. We're thankful that you so greatly, so deeply loved us, that you gave your very all for us by sending your Son. I thank you, Lord, for those that so many years ago prayed for Everett. Thank you, Father, for touching his life and bringing him to salvation in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for his commitment and his dedication to you through these years, for his faithfulness as a husband. And God, we just remember Louise often and rejoice in the fact that she's with you. We're thankful, Father, for his daughter Jeannie and, Lord, her, her life and her blessing and the blessing that you give Everett through her and her presence here tonight. And God, we want to thank you for blessing us 
by letting us simply be acquainted with this man and to serve together with him. And Lord, tonight we thank you that we've been able to lift our voices in praise. We've been able to sit and just simply listen and soak in all the great blessings you've given us through music and for giving one as effort the talent to be able to share that and the spirit in which you'd want him to share it in. Thank you for each one that's had a part in the service tonight. And I pray we might go from here with a deeper desire, with a greater desire, Father, to be faithful as your servants. And whatever you've given to us, let us use it all to the honor and glory of the Lord. Thank you for this one that's been a testimony and continues to be a testimony before us. Continue to richly bless his life. And together, Lord, as a church, may we continue to move forward in daily looking to you for the guidance that our life needs. Committed, Father, to live for you and to tell for you and to tell for you and to tell for you.